Welcome back to our next session within Open Doors at the University of Tartu. And this session is dedicated to programs in languages and cultures. And during this session, uh, our programs, following programs are going to be introduced. European languages and cultures, Estonian and Finno-Greek languages, and teaching Russian as a foreign language. I would like to remind you that if you would like to ask any of the questions, there is a possibility to leave your questions under Q&A button in WorkSup. So next to the info session, uh, you can find this possibility. And then we will answer your questions online. Also, I would like to introduce our speakers today. Today with me, I have Riley Marlin, who is going to present first, and she is going to talk about European languages and cultures. And then I have Kerstin Klump, who is going to introduce our new, brand new program, who is going to start uh, its admission only this year, European, Estonian and uh, Finno-Greek languages program. And then finally, I have two of our speakers online who are going to introduce teaching Russian as a foreign language. And I have online Ivan Polinin and Olha Burdakova, uh, who are currently in Narva. Uh, so all in all, this is the program of our today's info session. Please leave your questions at any point, even during the presentations, and then we are going to answer them online right in the end of the info session. And please don't leave us right after the info session, because we are going to host a student discussion with the students from these programs, and they are going to also outline their perspective of studying this program and their experience of living in a Estonia. All right, let's start then with our first presentation. Riley will talk about European languages and cultures. Uh, hi from me too. So my name, as you heard, is Riley Marling. I'm professor of English at the uh, University of Tartu and uh, I'm here in the capacity as the program director for our MA program in European Languages and Cultures. Frequently students ask uh, what is a European language and obviously there is no one language. We are talking about multiple languages and uh, the aim of our program is to both talk about language and culture and fit them together. So uh, when uh, students ask me why should I study uh, European languages and cultures, my main answer is that uh, the aim is to give you both knowledge and skills to help you become mediators between culture. Frequently we learn one language, we frequently learn about our own culture, but we cannot bring things together. So in our culture, uh, on a program, sorry, we're trying to teach you about that bridge building, about uh, being somebody who understands another culture well enough to introduce it at home, to translate between the cultures, to explain, for example, complicated things that are happening in the world today. Our program is in some ways built on a very traditional philological basis, so to say. In other words, we teach modern languages and also classical languages. Assuming that uh, if you want to mediate between cultures, you first of all have to speak a language and also have to understand how language operates. On top of that, we uh, pay a lot of attention to linguistic expression. In other words, what can be done with language? For example, literary texts. But on the basis of this basic core of language knowledge, linguistics knowledge, literature knowledge, and cultural knowledge, you have a lot of flexibility in building study paths. In other words, we have been able to accommodate students who come to us both with an academic interest. So, for example, academic interest in linguistics. We recently placed a PhD student in uh, Birmingham uh, coming out of our program. Uh, but we also have students who are more interested in practical application of this linguistic and cultural knowledge. And our program tries to accommodate both of these two approaches. Um, I will be happy to explain this later on. The program itself is kind of complicated. I think uh, one of the more complicated ones that is being talked about um, uh, in this info session because we have six different specialties. Uh, we have a big label above us, but we basically teach English, French, Spanish, German, Scandinavian languages, and Russian. Um, so in all of those um, uh, specialties, there is a combination of language and literature, plus classical philology. Because of the, uh, the nature of classical philology, that is 
the only specialty we have that is uh, open only to people who are proficient in Estonian. So I'm sorry for the international students who would like to do classical philology. That is not an option available at this point. You might be able to take classes in Latin or Greek, but we cannot offer the whole specialty. However, in all other specialties, international students are not only welcome, but uh, they have been welcomed and they have been successful in our program. Because in all of the other uh, five specialties, we teach the specialty module in the language of the specialty. In other words, if you come to study English, you learn in English. If you come to study French, you take classes in French. If you come and study uh, German, you take classes in German. And uh, this makes uh, this program very international. We currently, strangely enough, have uh, multiple American students, for example, studying German in Tartu. So um, this type of linguistic mobility within our program is um, regular and useful. Um, and as I already said, I mean, the specialty module is the core of your studies. This is where we give you a grounding in linguistics, literature, and culture in slightly different combinations in each specialty because our departments have different uh, academic backgrounds and we want to showcase, so to say, the best we have. So if one department is stronger in translation, they will showcase that. If some department is strong in, uh, let's say, modern uh, literatures, that's going to be the core. Um, and the idea of this is that even the students who come from outside traditional humanities can get the, you know, feet on the ground, so to say. They get, 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 get some grounding in understanding the meta level of language, some terminology about discussing, uh, discussing literature or discussing culture. So we build a core of what our specialty is about. But on top of that, you can start building many other things. And this is where those uh, academic and career interests come in that uh, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. Um, and there are basically four elements in which you can sort of uh, uh, tailor this program to what you want it to be. First of all, you can pick one of the two graduate schools in the humanities. We have two of them. The aim of these graduate schools is basically bring together students from all over humanities. So any humanities department student has to take something from this pot. And uh, this is the place where you get out of your little comfy family of your own specialty and hang out with other people. Um, other people from history, other people from, let's say, linguistics, other people from, let's say, um, Estonian literature. And in both of these graduate schools, we have one for people who are more interested in linguistics and translation, and the other uh, more, for students more interested in the humanities, have courses in English. So the idea is that uh, even if you're not proficient in Estonian, you are able to participate in this uh, sort of uh, faculty-wide conversation on the humanities. The other modules, however, are much more free. So uh, the one that you can use maybe the most to build your uh, own study path is the so-called elective module, in which you can basically take whatever you want. Uh, but uh, the only limitation is that somehow this elective module has to make up a systematic whole that supports your MA thesis or your MA project. In other words, you, for example, uh, you want to study uh, intercultural communication between, let's say, English, uh, let's say, United States, and let's say, Mexico. Uh, it would be logical for you to take... An, the main module in English, let's say, and the elective in Spanish, or vice versa, so that you build up these twin competences. We basically allow you to take uh, electives anywhere. It doesn't have to be humanities. Uh, if, it, uh, if you can speak another language, we're extremely happy if you use the opportunities that we have in our uh, college, but you can technically take it anywhere. We also very strongly recommend international mobility. Of course, because we are about foreign language and foreign cultures, we uh, actively want our students to spend uh, at least one semester of their studies abroad. And that would be a perfect way of uh, using the elective module, because Tartu is a small university, and therefore the uh, uh, options available internationally uh, would really, truly help you do whatever you want. You bring that competence back, you make it work here. Our uh, departments have very extensive web of um, Erasmus agreements, plus you will be able to take advantage of the many uh, university-wide agreements Tartu has. Plus, in the specialties of French and Russian, we actually have a double degree program with the University of Lyon in France. So uh, this is one thing that uh, I cannot uh, repeat often enough. Uh, the, this month of February, I think I have spent 
at least a week writing letters of reference to students who want to go someplace. So uh, um, it's uh, uh, even in today's uncertain world something we do. Um, in the optional module, you can uh, again pick whatever you want, and uh, this is not something that is uh, directly linked to your studies. We allow you to, so to say, broaden your perspectives. Many of our students, for example, uh, choose to study Estonian uh, under this module, but you can basically take uh, other languages, do gymnastics or whatnot. Uh, entrepreneurship skills, project writing are things that I personally recommend as more professionally useful. The final two. Uh, Parts of the uh, study path that you can choose are practical training. Uh, so we believe that all students have to do something practical in addition to studying. Uh, so we have multiple options available and the, the sky is the limit, so to say. It basically depends on what language you speak and what you can do. We usually can place you in, a, in some place where you are able to practice what you need. And finally, you can choose to write a thesis. Obviously, choosing a thesis topic is a big choice. Uh, you can uh, take yourself in very different directions. But maybe it's worth emphasizing that in addition to the traditional academic thesis, we also allow students to graduate with a project. So uh, something that is more hands-on, more practical, and more applied. So both of these directions exist, are possible, and um, uh, you can choose which of them you want to do with, first of all, your supervisor, but also me, program director. And uh, I will be happy to give examples of things like that. Most of our students, I have to say, uh, still graduate with a thesis because they tend to want to write something um, more systematic, but uh, the pr practical module is gaining uh, popularity as well. Um, basically, the important thing for you is uh, learn to use this freedom well. Um, as you know from Spider-Man, with uh, great freedom, great power comes great responsibility. So in this case too, uh, we uh, try to give you an idea of the options out there so that you can uh, choose your cho make your choices well. Uh, we offer a, a an MA seminar in your specialty at the beginning of your studies so that uh, somebody who knows your area gets you grounded, so to say, and helps you make good choices. Um, I will be there, uh, but um, um, your main um, advice comes from a supervisor or from our coordinator, and we, I have given you some other contacts there. Um, since uh, you are probably here uh, curious as to what you need to do, uh, the uh, admission requirements are very simple in some ways. We require that you have a bachelor's degree, but we don't speci specify what it needs to be in. You don't have to have uh, the BA in the same area. You have to prove English language proficiency um, and uh, uh, the University of Tartu homepage, and you can find the link on my slides as well, uh, shows you what uh, tests are accepted. So you have to have official proof of B2 English because even if you study, for example, Russian, you nevertheless need to take classes in English and without B2 you will not cope. Uh, just be honest to yourself. We test your proficiency in the respective language um, uh, in an entrance examination. So again, if you want to study English, you actually do have to speak English. We don't start teaching it. If you want to you know, study French, you have to have French in order to take classes and write a thesis in it. And most importantly for you, uh, you may apply before you have completed your BA degree. So for you, that's the most important thing. You get a conditional acceptance and so we sort of definitively accept you when you are done. Uh, the comp decisions have to be made uh, over the summer. I'm not going to risk a specific date, but uh, you have to decide uh, uh, by August. So, um, the admission requirements uh, can be seen on the web as well. Uh, we basically require two pieces of paper from you, a motivation letter in English, you have to prove that you can write that text in English, and then an essay in the language of the specialty. So, again, in French, Russian, English, uh, whatever you choose. Um, the topics already are available online. Um, I hope that those of you who are curious have already checked them out and started reading the essay texts. On the basis of these two things, uh, we pick the strongest candidate who get to go to the second round, which is the admission interview. And this is also conducted in the language of the specialty to test whether you uh, wrote your essay yourself, of course, as well as whether you are freely able to converse in the language of the specialty. We, uh, at uh, this year, have uh, 22 positions, of which we have uh, 15 tuition waiver scholarships for basically EU citizens, um, uh, and two tuition waiver scholarships uh, from citizens of third countries. Plus, we have five tuition-based positions. 
to anticipate the question, our tuition fee is 4,000 euros a year, which is a standard for uh, the programs in our specialty. So uh, this is uh, the average story. Uh, all of this information is available online. You can check this out on your own in your free time. Uh, the deadlines, um, uh, uh, just to go through the basics as well, uh, the essay topics uh, went live uh, February 15th, and so uh, they. I hope some of you at least have checked them out. Uh, you have until March 15th to write the essay, and as well as complete your motivation uh, uh, letter. So uh, that is the end of that uh, game, so to say. Then the door closes, and the committees uh, read your paperwork. And the students who pass this first uh, hurdle, so to say, get to be um, uh, invited to an interview and will let you know about the results uh, personally. Uh, there are two dates uh, and all interviews are going to be conducted online for obvious reasons in, in this time of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we hope to give the first admission results by May 15th. In other words, uh, you will uh, know about your conditional offer by that time. However, I really want to emphasize that that first date is not the final date. Um, we usually get a lot of motion in those uh, uh, student numbers. Students uh, pick universities, they make decisions about going to study somewhere else. So even if you don't get in um, in the first, uh, on May 15th, you might find yourself on the list of accepted students a few weeks later or a few months later. The academic year, this year begins August 29. So if you're planning to come to Tartu, plan for that. And so, this is very, very dense, but I uh, repeat once again, this information is available online. You can uh, check the website of the program and uh, you will find all its information here. Today is not the last time when you will meet this. And uh, to finish my presentation, I just uh, want to uh, bid you welcome. Uh, our college is in the very center of the uh, uh, university's historical campus. This picture is of our college, currently covered in scaffolds, but it will be free uh, of those scaffolds in August. And please join us. Thank you very much, Riley, for your presentation and for outlining all the most important dates and admission requirements for the program. Uh, if you would like to apply to European Languages and Cultures program or if you are thinking about this program, please leave your questions right now and we are going to answer them after all presentations are done. Also, you're, we are going to send you the slides so you will be able also to find all of the information on the slides after the event uh, and you will be also able to uh, contact Riley personally if you have any other questions. And now, right now, let's uh, move to another presentation. And we have a presentation about Estonian and Finno-Ugric languages, which is which will be given by Gerson. Thank you. So I'm Gerson Klump. I'm a professor of Finno-Ugric studies at the University of Tartu, and uh, we are launching this autumn a new study program. It's called Estonian and Finno-Ugric languages, and um, of course, Estonian is a Finno-Ugric language too, so this is not um, some kind of opposition. It means that uh, you can concentrate either on studying Estonian or on studying other Finno-Ugric languages, which I will show in a moment in detail. Um, this program is unique in the world. We were a bit surprised ourselves that there is no um, curriculum on that field, which is uh, entirely in English. And uh, we thought it might be an interesting idea to come up with this. Our experience with uh, students from abroad who come here via Erasmus um, are that they are often acquainted with one or two Finno-Ugric languages but not enough in order to study in that particular country, Hungary, for example, or Finland, or Estonia. And it might be nice to offer a program which uh, includes language learning, a lot of language learning, but it's not necessarily, um, but, but it's not uh, that you need the language um, before you start your studies. Um, this is the building where we are situated. <laughs> it's on the other side of, <laughs> of Riley's building. Um, 
it's the um, philosophical the, or the the the, the um, faculty of arts, and we are on the fourth floor. Um, the program comes from one particular institute. It's called Institute of Estonian and General Linguistics. And uh, this general linguistics shows a bit that uh, we understand ourselves mainly as an, as an institution which deals with linguistics, with particular languages and with a focus on linguistics. Um, this department includes, or this institute includes three um, subunits in addition to Estonian and the finno ugric department, namely a department of general linguistics, a department of computational linguistics, and um, a sub-department of digital humanities. Um, we are one of the foremost Estonian and finno ugric research centers in the world. This is on the one hand a quite easy thing to do because there are not that much Estonian and finno ugric research centers in this world. Um, we deal with languages which are comparable, comparably small languages, despite the fact that they are official languages of the European Union, Estonian, Finnish and Hungarian. Um, but there is quite a diversity and not everywhere where you can study these languages, you get all of them in that concentration. Um, and the research areas at our institute, they uh, include historical approaches, they include social linguistics, language acquisition and also language processing, uh, which is a Mm, let's say a main task of the uh, digital humanity part. Um, as I said, so there are four departments. There are two laboratories. One is the laboratory of spoken Estonian. The other one is a phonetic laboratory concentrating on phonetic studies. Um, we have more than 80 people working at that uh, institute and the average number of our students is approximately 100. 80, between 180 and 200. Um, I have mentioned uh, the, other well, the other curricula, they are of course, um, for example, Estonian or also Estonian as a foreign language, Finno-Ugric studies, but these cu other curricula, they are entirely in Estonian, which does not mean that there is no English-based teaching occurring. Single courses may be in English, but it's not possible to uh, absorb these curricula entirely in English uh, in opposition to this new a program. We have also Erasmus partner universities. Of course, our focus is in other finno ugric countries like um, uh, Hungary or Finland, but we also have Erasmus relations, good Erasmus relations with Germany, for example, and other countries too. This is a map which shows where Estonian is taught all over the world, taught by say Estonian lecturers which are sent there from Estonia and as you see the biggest the most dense concentration is of course in Europe and this is also where the other departments and institutes of uh, Finno-Ugric languages are usually situated. Um, our specializations as I may have mentioned are Estonian or Finno-Ugric languages. Um, and no matter which of these specializations you choose, you have access to courses which are more theoretical, some are more practical, they are uh, concentrating on synchronic or diachronic linguistics, and of course we also take care that you have the possibility to develop your digital skills. Um, as concerns the uh, Finno-Ugric languages, this is of course um, a package of languages and um, the 
two languages, the two main languages are Finnish and Hungarian, which are both taught by um, native speaker lecturers who come from Hungary or Finland. But we have native uh, speaker teaching in Komi, uh, Finno-Ugric language spoken in northern Russia. We have from time to time Mari taught a uh, language from central Russia. And of course, the language teaching is also uh, including a lot of structural courses. That is, you get acquainted with the structure of a language. So the focus is not that you speak this language, but that you have it as you, at your hands for linguistic studies of all kinds. And these courses uh, include also smaller languages spoken in Siberia, like Hanti or Mansi or Samoyed languages. And of course, also uh, the so-called minor Finnic languages. That is the closest relatives of Estonian and Finnish, which are spoken in the Baltic Sea area, like Karelian, Votic, Ingrian, or Livonian. So here is a choice of all these um, uh, activities which are reflected in teaching and also in research in our institute. This is a bit difficult probably to study um, because it's a bit small, uh, but we are new, so I don't have anything better to offer right now. But that's, it, that's in essence the structure. So we, the blue part uh, on top is the general part which everybody who studies this program has to absolve this our courses in Estonian and culture, Estonian language and culture, uh, basic introduction into Finno-Ugri languages and language technology and corpora. And then you specialize and concentrate on either Estonian or uh, a Finno-Ugric language or a choice of Finno-Ugric languages. And this can be supplemented then with uh, courses from the elective modal, electives modal, and if necessary also from the optional courses modal. So if you plan, for example, to complete your knowledge of Estonian or to start with Estonian and also get as far as possible with Hungarian, then you can uh, use these modals for additional language course teaching. Just an example. Um, but of course you can also use uh, these models in the yellow area uh, for, for example, get uh, a basic knowledge of Russian, which is never bad if you work with Finno-Ugric languages, or do something completely different um, if necessary. And then there is a thesis um, which involves 30 ECTS points. And as Riley has said before, there's also the possibility of a master, pro master project, uh, more hands on. And I would like to give you an example now, but there is no example yet. So I would be happy if somebody comes up with a good idea of a master project and we are certain, certainly willing to support this if it is uh, thematically appropriate. Um, this is a little uh, view on these uh, specialization uh, models. They contain basically what I have talked about before. Um, and I move on to the question, so why should you study this in um, Tartu? Tartu is situated quite nicely um, in the Finno-Ugric world, so to say. So there is Finland in the north, there are the Finno-Ugric nations um, in Russia, and a lot of them have communities here in Estonia. And so, for example, this is a folklore group. It does not exist in this form any longer, but it was a couple of years ago. These are Mari women 
And in the center, for example, this is a Maori linguist, um, Natalia uh, Lebedina, who has been studying here. And one of them, I don't see, ah, the second one to the left from her, this is um, <clears throat> Jelena Lastochkina, who has written her dissertation in Tartu, successfully defended her thesis a couple of years ago. So um, it does not mean that if you come here and study that you have to dance and sing, but if, you <laughs> if you're interested that in the, let's say, the life of the Finno-Ugrians, um, then you get some of this definitely here in Tartu too. There are a couple of organizations who are quite active. Um, the other thing is that we are very well connected. So Finno-Ugric Studies has a network on an Erasmus Plus uh, program which organizes winter schools, um, courses across the European institutions, that is in Germany, Hungary and Finland, and we are growing currently, so we also have these programs. We are currently offering these programs also to students in Poland, for example. And um, that means that you have the possibility to take part in Finno-Ugric teaching programs, which go beyond that what we have to offer here, particularly in Tartu. And these are um, offered every year. We have a lecture series on linguistics here at the University of Tartu, which makes sure that you don't feel like isolated. We have a lot of coming and going of uh, different linguists and uh, there is always the possibility to see more than what is offered by the people actually working here. Um, one of the focuses uh, which we usually have is that um, working with languages, minor languages or dialects involves also fieldwork and uh, language documentation opportunities. This is a bit, uh, has a bit changed in the last years due the, to the COVID situation, but basically this is something which is going on and currently uh, a lot of, let's say, documentation methods are developed which um, create access to native speakers via the internet. And Tartu has a good tradition in that sense and we continue with this. These are the people who are teaching here and if I introduce them, I will use up too much time. So <laughs> have a look at them and believe me, they are experts in different fields all related to Estonian and Finno-Greek languages. This is uh, a very important person who is responsible for uh, giving you advice in all kinds of fields. So this is uh, what I did not manage to say and which can be read on our uh, web page, the practical information about applying. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerson, for your presentation. Also, you will receive the slides and you are going to be able to check the information about admissions and career opportunities. But anyways, if you have any questions to ask right now, you can also leave us your questions and we will answer them after the last presentation. And uh, right now, I guess we are going to move to the next presentation, which is... Uh, going to be given by our colleagues uh, from Narva, by Ivan and Olga. And this information is, uh, this uh, uh, presentation is going to be dedicated to master's programs uh, teaching Russian as a foreign language. And uh, I guess the floor is yours. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Our usual Zoom conversation? Yes, well, we can hear you. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. If you can't, just scream louder, please, and uh, I will hear you then. Uh, the thing is that we probably should have accustomed to the new reality at uh, this very moment. And uh, if I would be, if I would have written this presentation yesterday or uh, several days ago, 
I uh, probably could rephrase it. So I apologize in advance uh, if some of the phrasings uh, may be found uh, offensive by some of the candidates uh, or I would also probably have to mention that even in the times like this, to keep the cultural connections and uh, teaching Russian as a foreign language is important, uh, even in the security or from the security and the cultural aspects. So let us proceed to the presentation itself. Thank you very much. So why study in Russian in Narva? The Estonian city of Narva is located on the border of the European Union and the Russian Federation just 130 kilometers away from St. Petersburg. Narva is a Russian-speaking city with the Russian being a uh, being, um, native language for almost 95% of its inhabitants. So there is quite a language immersion for any person wishing to study the Russian language here uh, in Narva without ever leaving the European Union. Studying in Narva gives an opportunity to improve the Russian language proficiency in everyday and social cultural communication in the city environment. And uh, this is one of the reasons why every year Narva College is chosen as a place for short-term and long-term studies of Russian by about 100 students from the USA, France, Great Britain, Sweden, Netherlands, uh, Republic of Taiwan, and uh, many other countries. So why study Russian in Narva? Narva is a small town, about 60,000 residents, uh, which is quite convenient for living and studies. And the university and the uh, actual campus uh, is within a walking distance from dormitory, about 15 minutes. Narva College is a regional college of the University of Tartu, uh, which was founded in uh, 1999. It follows all academic and research traditions of the University of Tartu. Uh, the student body includes more than 500 students, including 136 foreign students from Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Kazakhstan, and other countries. Uh, overall, the college offers 12 study programs at bachelor's, master's, and applied higher education levels. And the college has a highly qualified academic staff of teachers of the Russian language culture and literature who could uh, who conduct research and provide methodological support in teaching Russian as a foreign language and who have uh, at least 10, 20 year experience of teaching uh, this subject. So aside of the uh, language immersion that you will experience within the city, we actually have uh, quite proficient staff, academic staff, which will uh, hone your methodological and uh, other skills related to the language. Uh, the campus building of Narva College, or the dormitory, is a modern building constructed, well, uh, yeah, sorry, the campus building is constructed in 2012, so it's the study building. And according to the unique architectural project that combines an innovative study environment uh, with present day requirements to it, and the university dormitory was built in 2020, and the building uh, of which you can actually see on the picture or right in front of us and which confused me in the beginning of this slide. And it offers a comf comfortable environment for studies, uh, sport and leisure. And the dormitory also houses a library and a swimming pool, uh, again, which you can see from the picture on the slide. So what about the program itself, uh, the program details? The degree awarded is the Master of Arts in Education uh, with the specialization of teaching Russian to foreigners. Uh, the duration of the program is two years. Uh, the uh, amount of ECTS awarded is 120. The study form is full-time regular studies. Uh, the program is taught primarily in the Russian language with uh, additional courses in English. Uh, basically, the English language courses which are supposed to improve your uh, English language proficiency. And the tuition fee is 3,800 euros, uh, euros a year. So what are the advantages of the program? Uh, first of all, it's an opportunity to receive philological and pedagogical education in only two years. Uh, you will also uh, acquire 
or uh, have an opportunity to improve the mastery of the Russian language as a foreign language and um, actually can get a C1 level in such a short time uh, if you have, uh, of course, the uh, necessary prerequisites such as uh, B2 level of Russian or if you are a native speaker. Uh, also, you can use our Erasmus programs. Um, you have an opportunity to go for an Erasmus exchange uh, e either for uh, Erasmus studies or for the uh, Erasmus internship, you may spend a semester abroad at a partner university and even an additional semester after your study, uh, after your studies will be finished. Uh, also, we are quite flexible and there is a flexible mode of studies with e-learning support for every course of the program, which is uh, quite important considering that we, have, we are living in the COVID times and uh, everybody is prone to this uh, illness. And uh, this year, we actually started with the hybrid studies and our uh, teachers uh, have a profound support, we, about which um, Olga will probably tell you better if you'll have additional questions. So what are the uh, modules? Uh, the first module is the narrow field mo module, the uh, language system. Uh, in which you, aside of the uh, traditional courses, you will also have a chance to uh, get the basics of the Estonian language and uh, learn the pra uh, practical Estonian in the uh, volume of six ECDS. Uh, the second module is the core uh, competences, uh, where you will learn more about the trans translation theory, the functional aspect of grammar, uh, text linguistics, uh, stylistics, the norm and variance of the Russian language, and also have an um, understanding of the Russian uh, culture in context. Uh, the third module is, is focused on psychology and pedagogy, uh, pedagogical science. Uh, so basically, uh, aside of the teacher's identity, the actual um, uh, courses which will give you a teacher's methodology, uh, you'll also, you may also learn about um, entrepreneurship and uh, starting a business, uh, and um, a little bit more about the Russian literature in the studies of Russian as a foreign language and how to use it as a tool. Uh, the final module uh, presupposes the pedagogical practice or a pedagogical internship uh, and actual training in Russian uh, language teaching. And we have uh, quite a few partners who are interested in, uh, in our interns uh, abroad in the, within the European Union. So uh, we have uh, additional modules, which is the uh, uh, elective subjects, and uh, you can improve your English language, uh, considering that you only need to possess a modest knowledge in order to enroll to this program, you will have plenty of opportunities to improve your English in the course of the studies. Uh, considering the uh, language environment, the uh, exchange students uh, whom we have here, and uh, also uh, an opportunity to go for a semester abroad. Uh, also have optional subjects uh, on, with a volume of six ECTS, and you'll have to write a master's thesis of uh, 18 ECTS, but it shouldn't scare you too much. You will have everything you need by then. So what are the entry requirements? Uh, you need to have bachelor's degree, uh, or um, I have to clarify here, any bachelor's degree. So you're not, you don't have to, to be a linguist in order to apply for this. Though uh, we, uh, of course, uh, linguists usually favor uh, this program, but you, you may have uh, almost any qualification in, in order to enroll. We'll teach you everything you need. Uh, you also, uh, need to have a confirmed proficiency in Russian at the B2 level. And uh, the applicants who haven't had Russian medium school education or haven't received a relevant university education in the Russian studies are uh, eligible to take the Russian proficiency test of Narva College. Uh, the specific dates we will uh, send you via an email. So how is the uh, application evaluated? Uh, we have uh, basically two scores. The first one is the motivation letter, it yields 40% uh, of the final score, and the admission interview, which is about 60% of the final score. And for each evaluation criteria, 
uh, the maximum score is 100 points and uh, the minimum positive score uh, is 51 point. The applicant needs to receive at least 51 points for the information letter in order to qualify for the admission interview. Uh, after the interview, the final admission score is calculated and the maximum final score is 100 points. And you need to, to have at least 66 points of higher in order to be considered for the admission. So at this moment, I will uh, probably stop. Uh, if you have any additional questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, here you may have the uh, contact details. And uh, yeah, as I said, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Ivan, for your presentation. I hope right now you can see us. And uh, uh, if no, unfortunately, I don't have the honor. <laughs> Uh, I guess it, it will take a few few minutes uh, in order to see us. But if you are interested to study teaching Russian as a foreign language, please ask your questions and don't forget, of course, to apply. And uh, right now, I guess we are going to op open our Q&A discussion round and we received uh, some of the questions already. And I guess we will start with the question for Gerson. So the question is, uh, do I need to speak Estonian while applying to Estonian and Finno-Greek linguistics? And if yes, which level do I need to have? No, this is a clear answer. You don't, this program is um, <clears throat> meant to be for somebody who does not speak Estonian. Of course, you are invited to learn Estonian or to continue studying Estonian, but you don't need Estonian uh, to complete the program. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Another question we have for, for Riley for European Languages and Cultures. I have bachelor in a German and English teaching profile, Master of Education. Can the master program lead to a teaching career in Estonia? Again, a short answer. Uh, no, in the sense that it's not uh, like in the uh, in Estonian system, you need to have professional qualifications, which are only given out by teacher training programs. We run a parallel program in teacher training that unfortunately requires Estonian, and uh, so uh, you will be able to work as a teacher in Estonia, but we cannot give you the qualification of a teacher because of the uh, uh, qualification system that exists in the country. However, uh, the degree allows you to have a temporary contract of teaching and many students do that. Plus, if you want to pick up that degree and you have some Estonian, you will be able to do that parallel uh, to studying with us. But yeah, Estonian is needed for that. We have also quite similar question to Gerson about career perspectives, perspectives or what can I do after graduating Estonian and Finno-Greek linguistics? Well, you are at that depends, of course, a lot on uh, what uh, specialty you choose. But basically, you are um, a linguist with a with a specialization. You um, can um, choose courses which uh, increase your uh, skills in, say, language processing, um, and work for language tech um, companies. You are, um, if you're going into an academic career, then you're qualified, for example, for doctoral studies and continue, um, say, with linguistics. Um, we do not provide uh, teacher degrees for the Estonian uh, school system. This is not uh, possible, as Riley said, um, on the base of English studies. Otherwise, I mean, we have we have teacher training, Estonian teacher training at our institute, but this mm -hmm. is in Estonian. Now, um, language tech have I mentioned, um, and of course anything which has to do with languages, language teaching is um, a possibility to get a foot into the market. But of course, I mean, we are a humanities program and we have no, um, say, we cannot, we cannot compete with programs which have a specific design for the labor market. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. Uh, next question we have to Ivan. Hello, I'm a student from China. I'm currently studying in China as a postgraduate student. I got my bachelor's degree last July, majoring in Russian language and literature. I want to study teaching Russian as a foreign language in Tartu at Tartu University, it's in Narva. I'm wondering whether you would accept an exchange postgraduate student. Thank you. Uh, we, of course, will be happy to see you here. And again, I have to clarify that Narva is, uh, <laughs> you know, is another city than Tartu, even though we are University of Tartu, we're still in the city of Narva, which is uh, closer to St. Petersburg. Uh, and which is on the very border with Russia. You can literally walk into it, or at least you could uh, until some time ago. Uh, so yes, of course, you can uh, you can enroll. Uh, you, 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 of course, may uh, submit your documents. Uh, the only thing that I probably need to, again, clarify here, I didn't get the part where, when you mentioned about the uh, exchange student. So as an exchange student for that, we have an Erasmus program, and you need to. Uh, your university will have to uh, get into an Erasmus Plus international agreement with us. But if you have already already completed your program in your home university, so yes, please, of course, uh, fill up your uh, paperwork on the, the Estonia Dream Apply and uh, come here. Thank you very much. Uh, next question we have to Riley uh, about the double degree program in French and Russian languages with a partnership with Lion. In uh, which languages we must write our essay? How many semester we can spend in the receiving university? So the uh, the double degree then exists in two specializations, and uh, usually this means that you spend one year in Tartu and the other year in Lyon. So it's basically uh, the year in which you go to Lyon depends basically on the situation. Currently, we have uh, three students in Lyon. Uh, they had, well, their studies were disrupted. They couldn't go last year for obvious reasons. Um, and so uh, it got, it's shifted the studies around, so to say. But the idea is that you do 50-50. Um, and obviously, in order to study in Lyon, you have to be proficient in French. Uh, that is one thing that, uh, if you plan to, for example, do a double degree in Russian with Lyon, then uh, you should come and maybe take one year of intensive French with us and then go to Lyon the second year. Usually uh, students choose this at this point, um, have chosen to uh, write the thesis in uh, the place where they have better access to materials. If you're writing on French, it makes sense to write that in France, so to say. But uh, it is not, it's something that is up to negotiation and we uh, look at your needs and your wants, so to say, carefully. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there is also a very related question to this one uh, about the proficiency of the language in the specialization. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So what proficiency, what language proficiency we need to have wh while applying to the University of Tartu in the specialization language? Um, well, uh, it depends. Um, as uh, in English, we kind of expect you, expect you to be at least at C1 because um, English is so widely spoken and uh, uh, therefore the level of uh, language is usually higher. In other languages, I would say B2 is the minimum. You can work up from that level because in uh, French and German, um, also in Swedish, we start our own students at Tartu uh, from basically zero. And so uh, there is a group of other students whose proficiencies are going to be in the B2 plus level and you can uh, scaffold up. You don't need to provide any documentation to us. You will just need to uh, prove your ability to speak and your motivation to learn during the interview. As I said, English is slightly different, but in other languages, we have taken in students who don't feel comfortable, uh, fully comfortable with writing, for example, and they have successfully graduated. For example, we had a student from Italy who finished in Russian. Um, he really worked hard when he was here. He spent one uh, uh, semester in St. Petersburg. Uh, those were the days. Um, and he was able to work himself up. So we had positive examples from different specialties of people who have uh, scaffolded up the language. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. We also received some questions in Russian. Luckily, I can speak Russian, so I can translate uh, them directly to Ivan. Uh, so the question is, what uh, kind of courses we can take in Russian in Narva? 
uh, basically all of them, uh, or at least most of them, are in Russian, uh, aside of the uh, English language course, which is supposed to uh, improve your proficiency in the English language. So I hope this answers your question. The entire program is basically in Russian, aside of the English. I have a, a little bit related question about the admission process. So when applying, do I need to translate my documents into English and verify them, or I can just uh, submit them in Russian for Ivan, for Narva? Yeah, uh, in this sense, uh, probably in contrast with the uh, other departments, we do not require this procedure. So basically, for the uh, online application, you only need to scan your documents and send them to us. For the uh, paper version, we only need you to uh, stamp it with the notary or within your uh, school uh, where you actually received your diploma or your bachelor diploma. Uh, we also have next question to Gerson about the digital part of the project. So the question is about, could you please uh, provide examples of the courses in digital humanities that are offered within the Finno-Greek uh, program? Yes, this is a difficult question because um, this is a selection of uh, courses which we have not taught yet in that sense. So um, the idea is to have some statistical training that uh, would enable people also um, which you need for, let's say, analysis in uh, linguistics, but then also programming and um, having teachers who are um, involved in language technology. Um, I ask for a little patience. I mean, we are coming up with the study program very soon with the courses which start this autumn. And then there is also the possibility to ask what will be in the second year. That's not a perfect answer, I know, but, yes, but it, our everything is so fresh. <laughs> yeah, our applicants can keep an eye on the website because we are going to update the uh, part where the courses are listed. So keep an eye on them and then you can, you can check more. Uh, so there is a question in the air about scholarship. M school, maybe let's uh, make like a round of... Uh, um, of uh, updates about the scholarship in each program. I know, Riley, that you have already mentioned about that, but if you can repeat, and then we are not going to come back to these questions. So um, our program is slightly different from the others because um, uh, we are one of the very few ones in which the majority of students actually are from Estonia. So you will be coming and studying with Estonian students. For that reason, uh, we have um, uh, large numbers of uh, tuition waiver scholarships for students from the EU and um, associated countries. So um, if you happen to be from the EU um, or from Estonia, um, the, you, there are 50 positions for you and we have two tuition um, uh, favor uh, waiver positions for students from the third countries meaning everybody else and uh, uh, those are it so to say there is no transfer between those two positions if we don't fill a position for the EU students we cannot extend that to the third countries of third citizens unfortunately um, however, if you are very uh, good in your studies, you achieve high marks, you are able to apply for the usual target performance uh, scholarship. That is not very high, but it is available to all students with excellent marks. Kirsten, what about your program? Yes, so uh, we also we have uh, tuition waivers and every application is automatically uh, an application for tuition waivers. So you don't have to file a, um, a separate uh, uh, application. These tuition waivers are of course restricted and they are then assigned according to the acceptance list which we have. Uh, in addition, we have living costs um, grants um, and these can be applied for separately. The exact number of these grants is uh, currently <laughs> uh, not clear. We have certainly some of them which we find. So we have statute um, within the institute and they are going to be assigned to students on the base of a separate application. Um, 
ideally this will be two for students who go into the uh, who specialize on Estonian and two for students who specialize on Finno-Ugric languages coming from two different sources. However, the second source is not confirmed yet. So um, here also I hope very soon more information. And this is the beginning, so we are currently increasing also the, 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 our efforts to provide more grants or stipends uh, in addition to the existing tuition waivers. Thank you very much, Ivan. What about you? We have only two tuition waivers uh, on the lucky day. Uh, usually it's like from one to two. So please be ready to bear your expenses on your own. And uh, if your uh, uh, academic achievement or if your interview and the motivation letter score will be high enough, you may get it. You may get the uh, tuition waiver, but I wouldn't count on it in advance, so please think about it. Mm -hmm. I have another question for your program for teaching Russian as a foreign language. Do I need to speak English in order to study the program? Uh, only uh, at a B1 level, so uh, your knowledge have to be limited to an extent. So you don't have to be fluent, but you have to be at least able to introduce yourself and get a basic uh, acquire basic understanding before the uh, interview. Uh, if you'll start immediately uh, honing your skills, uh, you'll get there. Don't worry. Thank you. Uh, there are questions about motivation letters. So maybe what is how to write a successful motivation letter, how to write a motivation letter to get a tuition waiver. Maybe Riley and everyone, we can also comment, what are you expecting from our applicants to write in their motivation letter to make this letter successful? Um, uh, I'm going to start from a really dumb thing to say, but please don't plagiarize your motivation letter. Um, uh, you know, the, there are sometimes uh, people who uh, seem to think that there is a perfect letter that exists on the internet that they can just use. The motivation letter should explain your motivation in uh, coming to study with us. So my first recommendation is to do some homework, look into our programs. I think that applies to everybody's program, and uh, uh, try to link that with your career goals. Um, and and uh, with uh, your academic goals, so that uh, you can put your own life into the context of the program. We do, uh, again, this is my subjective opinion, but I don't think that our uh, committees are going to be that uh, moved by you saying that uh, you have always loved Estonia or that. Uh, uh <laughs> Uh, so try to make it a little bit more specific, in other words, and uh, uh, show um, some uh, homework. I mm -hmm. think is what uh, I would say as a useful pointer. There is also a question if there are some, for example, achievements in sport, do they do applicant need to? No, I think that, you know, this is, uh, I, I see where it comes from, that in uh, many very competitive American programs, the program like in Harvard is looking at uh, the full person, so to say. And uh, obviously we too are interested in full people with uh, lives, but we are above all, especially when you are applying for, let's say, two tuition waiver scholarships that most of us have available to citizens of third countries, we are above all interested in whether you are going to be a motivated student in our program and whether you're going to cope and whether you're going to build on what we are able to give to you to make a career. And so um, work on the professional and academic side as opposed to these uh, sports achievements, my opinion. Gerson. Well, I do uh, completely agree. So, I mean, the... the um, you basically introduce yourself and your motives why you would study this. And I mean, I understand it can be sometimes difficult if you're young and you you feel an interest or you have an interest towards something, but you cannot really, really explain why you are interested, that it may seem attractive to you and you're also not 100% secure if that's really the way I want to go. Is that really interesting? Well, um at least try to express that, why it is Finno-Ugric languages, why it is Estonian, um, which you are interested in, why you would uh, choose particularly this part of the world to study, and um, what are your interests and plans with it. 
And if we are, we are lucky, I mean, we consider ourselves lucky if we have, due to the motivation letters, already an idea uh, if you would la rather be interested in Estonian or rather in finno ugric languages and also, for example, make suggestions when you think that you would be interested in something which you do not find exactly in the program and um, suggest that we could um, find a way how you combine, for example, language interests which are not particularly offered. We want to get to know you. That's the main mm -hmm. reason. Uh, I have one follow-up question. Uh, do I need to specify the specialization Estonian or Finno Greek languages already in the motivation letter? It's good if you specify it in the motivation letter. It's um, also good if you specify it in the interview and um, this is not a, how to say, juridical robust decision. So if you, when you start your studies, decide that um, you will change your uh, original uh, decision, then that's, of course, you have the right to do so. You should study what you are, what you need. You should get what you need. Yes. Um, I would like to just add one thing that I think is all, also useful to put into your letter of motivation. Um, explain your academic background. And uh, this is your, a great space to explain why, if your academic background is unusual, um, you are still a good candidate. This is a nice place where you can sort of uh, explain that, although I have never studied linguistics, for example, but I did uh, this internship someplace where I uh, met linguistics. And so try to make us see why we should pick you from a large field of, field of candidates and uh, giving some background into who you are academically can be really useful. Thank you very much, Ivan. What about the uh, motivation letter for teaching Russian as a foreign language? I also have one follow-up uh, email. Uh, in which language it should be written, in Russian or in English? Uh, it should be written in the Russian language. Also, again, uh, it's probably worth to uh, specify that we do not require a person to formally confirm the English language knowledge, only the Russian language. So we uh, actually tasked the person during the interview asking uh, basic questions in English. Now, concerning our motivation letter or the motivation letter or problem, uh, it's um, built around three aspects. The first of them uh, is description of the applicant's previous education and how uh, this education, the career path, is actually uh, related to the studies of the Russian language. So even if you were in a completely different area, just get creative. Uh, think about it, how exactly you could uh, connect this career path with uh, your uh, future program. The second one is the uh, research interests for your master thesis. You course can update it during your studies, but please, again, think about this in advance. And uh, the third uh, aspect is please explain your motivation to become a teacher of the Russian, uh, uh, of Russian as a foreign language. Uh, it's uh, highly important and uh, explain us how it will actually help you with your future career path. You, you don't have to have, uh, you know, a step-by-step -step guide of, of how you're going to do that. But at least you should have a rough idea of what you're going to do with the education that you receive. And you have to convince us that this will be useful for you and you'll have enough motivation to complete it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a few questions about working and studying at the same time. Uh, so uh, maybe we can all comment on that. So if it's uh, the applicant is actually asking if it's possible to work and study and if you would recommend actually to do that. Um, everything is possible. <laughs> Um, there, uh, uh, but I have uh, maybe uh, three points to make. I mean, first of all, Tartu is not a super big city. I mean, Narva is smaller, but uh, Tartu is not very big. And so the number of jobs available uh, for speakers of English will be relatively limited. Um, we do have students who do work, um, things like catering, for example, and uh, other uh, pretty menial uh, jobs. And it, uh, you, you can uh, probably combine it uh, with studying. So that's my second point, because we concentrate our teaching in uh, uh, a few days of the week. So it is possible to create a work schedule. Most of our classes take place uh, basically uh, Tuesday to Thursday. So you have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday 
free. Um, uh, however, Having said that, uh, uh, that's my third point, um, we do expect students to study full time. In other words, uh, um, the, uh, students uh, already this year, for example, have basically, after the first semester, said that, wow, I didn't think I will actually have to study all the time. So uh, you will have to find some kind of a, a balance, let's say. And uh, uh, so, Unlike in a bigger city, maybe this uh, uh, teaching and, uh, sorry, learning and uh, working is maybe not the easiest to combine, but it is possible. Kirsten, would you like to comment on that as well? Well, I mean, um, I know how the situation is. I have been, I have worked as a student a lot and I, from that experience, I also know that it is not ideal. And if you consider that the master program is two years, then I would rather recommend to uh, use these two years for intensive studying. And but the most important thing is though, uh, if you um, if you have a conflict between work and uh, studying, then you should talk to your teachers about that and be honest about it. Uh, and maybe I would also add the fact that uh, uh, you can, of course, use the uh, the summers. For example, we understand that uh, life is expensive, and uh, Estonia is increasingly a high cost of living country. But uh, uh, it is possible to take on a job for the summer months and uh, sort of save up so that you can uh, focus more on uh, studying during the semester um, and uh, uh, cope in this way. I think many students do that successfully as well. Thank you. Ivan, uh, what about uh, Narva? Well, I have good news and bad news. Uh, the good news uh, is actually that even though we are smaller than Tartu, uh, we have uh, fewer exchange students, so less competition for you. <laughs> bad news, uh, most of the service jobs actually require Estonian, even though most of the people uh, in the city, like the absolute majority, speaks Russian. Uh, again, if you are not a uh, native Russian speaker, it will be pretty difficult to find a job for you in the service industry. What we generally recommend is to have some kind of online job, which will be more flexible. And we have quite a few students who actually manage to do that, even though in the current conditions it might be more difficult. Uh, also, the cost of living here uh, is less expensive than in Tartu, by far, I'd say, uh, especially if we are talking about uh, renting. It will, like The uh, renting here will be twice cheaper, sometimes uh, three times cheaper. So yeah, you probably need to evaluate. And also, I would generally suggest our students to use Erasmus to the best of their capabilities. Like, for example, if you go even for... Uh, a couple months of internship during summer, it will be about 650 to 700 euros um, scholarship per month. So you will manage to at least, you know, cut some uh, money back. Uh, and plus uh, half a year of the um, internship in the, uh, uh, like the final six months uh, of the program. So you will have some flexibility and you will have some opportunities, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, we received another question in Russian about if it's possible to study or work in Estonia if you speak only Russian or Ukrainian. And uh, I guess Ivan already covered it a little bit. Um, and uh, for uh, teaching Russian as a foreign language, it is only B1 English required. And for the rest of the programs, we need B2 English. Uh, okay, next uh, question is about admission requirements. Uh, so do I need to have bachelor's uh, degree in linguistics? Um, maybe we can also uh, talk for, uh, about all of the programs. If uh, do you have like uh, prerequisite courses or uh, uh, qualifications in order to apply to your programs? Kirsten, if you would like, you yes, can we start. Have, we have been discussing that uh uh, quite intensively because um, on the one hand we are interested that people have a basic education in linguistics um, on the other hand if this basic if we if we ask too too much then it might 
uh, somebody might not feel attracted or it might be the, the end for, a, for an applicant. Basically, I would say that if you come from a completely different field which does not involve language learning and acquaintance with um, the structure and analysis of languages and the components linguistics have from social linguistics down to formal syntax if all this is a completely unknown field to you then i might not recommend this curriculum to you because you have too many um, too many things you have to catch up with within that two years and that makes it probably an unpleasant experience but if you <laughs> If you have an, if if you have a basic education in linguistics and some experience in language learning and with language structure, then you should not be then you should not be frightened that it is not enough. Then I guess it's fine. Really? Um, so from my side, the answer is no. Uh, you don't have to have a background in linguistics. Uh, in all specialty modules, we have uh, like serious linguistics classes but they are doable if uh, even if you don't have a background in it uh, in english we have had a couple of students who have come from completely different fields one from law and the other one from history and they have coped it requires work though uh, like gerson already said some familiarity with uh, linguistic concepts but if you have studied a language seriously for a year many years you probably have some awareness you need to know what a verb is <laughs> you need to know what a noun is yeah, yeah. and what a past tense is but that's a start if none of those words are familiar to you you probably will not feel comfortable but if you know those words we can manage Ivan do you have any thank you very much Ivan do you have any uh, pre-requirements to the bachelor's degree before applying to your master's program not really. Uh, I'd say uh, even though your uh, linguistic um, bachelor degree uh, make your life uh, easier here, a, at the same time will make it more boring because uh, you will probably repeat at least some of the stuff. Uh, but our requirements are quite simple. You got a bachelor degree and uh, Russian and the B2, you're in. Mm -hmm. so no specific requirements on that part. Thank you very much. We have another question about GPA. What average GPA should I have in order to apply and if it's uh, uh, actually influenced the admission process? Um, Riley, if you would like to start. Um, any BA, I think. Uh, that's, yeah. Was it about the time or the... About the grade. The, the grade, grade, grade uh, average grade. Uh, we don't look at your GPA at all. Um, yeah, this is something that you may mention, but uh, we will ask you about this in the interview, like how did you cope, but we are frankly more interested in your experience of writing a longer research paper in a foreign language than your average grade. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gerson? Well, this might become relevant at some point, say, if we have 50 applicants or 500, then this... <laughs> But I don't think that it's, uh, well, like Raini said, it's definitely not the first thing we look at. Thank you very much, Ivan. Is it important for you the average grade of your applicants? I'd say that the general requirement, uh, which concerns the entire University of Tartu, is 3.3 uh, at the minimum. So uh, I'd say that if you are past that uh, and you will manage to impress us, again, you're in. But you will have to try hard, actually. I mean, I, I will just add this point. I think Ivan's uh, uh, answer just is very important, that even if there is no formal threshold, uh, you are always competing against other people. And we obviously will uh, admit the best, and especially the tuition waiver scholarships go to the best. Uh, but the threshold part is low, so to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we also have some questions about the interview. So how to prepare to the interview? What kind of questions are going to be asked? Maybe you can also comment on that. Uh, maybe Gerson, if you can start. Well, I would be happy if you would tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I do this for the first time this year. And we basically um, uh, will ask 
about the things which you have in your motivation letter just to discuss these things. So you will be you will have the possibility to speak about your motivation letter. And um, then according to the application we might have questions. But I don't have I apologize, I don't have an experience yet with this. But That's if you uh, if you prepare for the interview um, just by making sure that all you have written in the motivation letter and in your application um, can be commented by you, then I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Riley. You have more experience. So, so my recommendation is, first of all, uh, think about your academic background and explain uh, how your aspirations to study with us is linked to this academic background. Show a connection. How did you get uh, to this application? Uh, you need to be able to explain this. Um, we definitely ask you about your previous experience of writing in foreign languages because we know that you have to write a long um, thesis. So knowing what you have done before is important information for us. Uh, we will ask you about... Uh, whether you have academic plans, you don't have to have them. We will never check what you said during the interview against your final thesis. But uh, of course, applicants who know what they want to do, or at least a direction in which they want to go in their studies are going to be better placed at the end of the interview. So I would think care carefully about um, what, uh, what I have done what I would like to do, how do I get from point A to point B, and what role Tartar studies would play in it. Have a plan. Uh, think, uh, think this through. It is uh, worth doing anyway. Thank you very much, Ivan. Side of the things that uh, we've already mentioned, uh, it's the motivation letter, uh, I would just give a general advice which concerns not only our problem, but uh, probably all of them. Just do your homework. Research the place where you're going to study. Uh, Google Maps it. Uh, you know, at least look at the pictures, uh, what it looks like. Just read about the university itself. Read about the college itself. If you'll confuse Narva with Tartu, it will definitely not help. <laughs> uh, it won't help you as well when you will get here and uh, find yourself uh, in a completely different place and in a completely different environment. So you have to understand where you're going and why you're going there. So if you'll try to convince us with this, uh, yeah, we'll be welcome. Thank you very much, Ivan. Unfortunately, our time is uh, over for this info session. Thank you very much to all participants for being with us today, for asking your questions. Thank you very much, our dear speakers, for presenting your programs. My wish to our uh, potential candidates would be study cultures and languages, come to study at the University of Tartu. Don't forget about the application deadline, which is March 15, which is coming quite soon. And if you have have any questions please contact our program managers uh, or uh, just uh, maybe follow up us afterwards uh, after the event and uh, right now we are going to continue in a while with uh, our discussion session with students so we are going to have a small break a short break and then we are going to come back stay with us thank you